everybody is enjoying the festival so far. Um, uh, Christine, you, you and your panel did a wonderful job yesterday with um, uh, the funding topic. So we are looking forward today to you know all the magic that you have in stock for us. And um, I think tomorrow we have another one more session uh, before the awards uh, ceremony on Saturday, uh, which is uh, actually the same time. So um, by noon, Central Standard Time on Saturday will be also uh, be live with the award ceremony. So I encourage all of you to participate in that one as well. All right, well, uh, let's get on to the um, topic of the day. And um, everybody is welcome. Thank you. He's the founder of the African Film Festival, TUF, and we are so honored to have you here and excited because today we are talking about a very, very interesting topic where a lot of producers, I think before we even get onto the topic, let's do a tally of how many filmmakers have had their films either uh, stolen, the idea stolen, or uh, they have not been able to protect their ideas and something went wrong. So if you've had a bad experience when it comes to legalizing your documentation or having a, a, a bridge of uh, like a disagreement with partners, please be, be writing it down on the chat box, intellectual property law. So let me challenge you on that so you can be able to give us some of your experiences on, your, on the chat box. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the African Film Festival Edition Turf, a master share. And uh, I'd really like to welcome and thank uh, Michelle Bruchez for giving us this time. And here we are going to be talking about intellectual property law yet once again at master share. Michelle, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. And uh, I'd really like you to introduce yourself again and tell us what it is that you do. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share my experiences with um, everybody. So I'm a media and entertainment lawyer. Um, my specialty is film and television production. Um, I, also, I also deal with distribution um, and other forms of entertainment law, music, um, theater, um, art, so um, my experience, I uh, started off my, my media and entertainment career in London, and I've worked at uh, Random House, the publishing company, dealing with the, the film options. Um, I then moved on to Disney, and then I went on to the BBC. And then um, just going on 10 years ago, I came back to South Africa, um, and I thought I'd bring back all the experience that I'd gained in London so that I could come and help um, the independent producers in South Africa. Um, there's not too many people who specialize in, in uh, film and television production in South Africa. So, um, yeah, so I thought that it was a real opportunity to share the experiences that I'd had in London. Great. And how is it going so far? Oh, it's going fantastic. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the film industry in South Africa and, and in Africa is absolutely amazing. And there's so much talent here. And the, the quality is, is no less than it is overseas in the UK and the US. So I think there's so much opportunity, especially with the video on demand platforms that are, are, are buying content um, from Africa. So yes, it's going very well and, and it's very busy. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. So Michelle, we're going to start talking about um, what is the chain of title and why is it important? Okay, so chain of title is absolutely the basics of, of um, your film and television production that you want to have all in order. Um, the chain of title is the unbroken chain of copyright ownership that you can trace from its, its creation um, right through 
to um, wear vests in the film company, um, which is either be the production company or the special purpose vehicle company that's opened up for the film. Um, and you need to have this in place um, so that you can avoid all those copyright infringement claims um, that, you know, that, that could happen once your film is released. And at that stage, you don't want to be withdrawing your film from distribution um, and having to pay people. Um, you know, obviously your budget's been spent and then you also don't want to have to spend more money re-editing the film before you can re-release it. So it's very, very important to have your a chain of title in place. So we're talking about uh, the chain, uh, the chain of title, and we're talking about the documents now that one needs uh, to put in place when they are developing their project. Sometimes you find that producers tend to to kind of wing it and not you know, to to have all the copy copyright documentations ready. So what would you advise a producer who's starting out their, their documentary or film, whatever it is that they're doing? Where can they start in terms of, docu uh, in terms of protecting their information? Um, look, it's very important to have the correct documentation. Um, you know, obviously it, it, it would be best if you could approach an entertainment lawyer who does film and television production to, to supply you with the templates that you can use. But I absolutely understand um, that during development phases, producers generally don't have money to pay lawyers um, to, to put the documentation in place. So if you can't do that, um, then I would absolutely recommend that, you know, from the very first stages, you, you have it down in writing, because I know a lot of producers do it um, on the word of people and they just kind of trust that everybody's going to eventually sign the documents if the film is funded. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I highly recommend that you just put it down on paper um, where the copyrights lie. Um, if you're hiring a script writer to, um, to write a script on a concept that you have, just make sure that you, you you have it in writing from the script writer that they are doing it on a, a work for hire basis and that they're assigning all the rights to you as the producer because the producer will need those rights in order to get funding um, and to produce the movie and to avoid the copyright infringement claims. So, um, you know, so, so I'd absolutely, re absolutely recommend that if you are buying um, the rights to a a book that you want to turn into a film, that you have that option in place. It doesn't have to be a long document as long as it's clear, mm -hmm. um, you know, what the terms are, what, you know, how long the option agreement is, uh, how much you're paying for it. And if you're not paying for the option upfront, how much you're going to pay if the film gets funding and you exercise that option. Um, and, and, you know, you should have other terms in there, like what the writer's credit is going to be, what the writer's involvement will be in the movie. So that's, that's for a literary option. If you, for instance, two producers together and you're discussing a concept, um, you know, there, there is going to be a crossover of, of copyright. Um, so when you are doing all the documentation, you know, for, for what you're planning on doing, you must just have a, a little, just a one page agreement between the two of you um, that, that says that you jointly own the copyright um, in equal shares um, and that one person can't go off and do it without the other one's permission. So they can be very basic documents as long as they're very clear about where the copyright ownership sits. So that would be my, my recommendation. Mm -hmm. I like that because uh, some Sometimes we, we, we tend to think that uh, you you need to have a lawyer in place to be able to do that. And as you talked about, sometimes we producers don't have enough money to do that. So a simple agreement and signed, mm -hmm. do you need to take it uh, to a lawyer to stamp it? Or because you know different countries have got different laws. Now, they, yeah, yep. Um, they, yeah, so different countries will have different laws. Um, some countries require that there are witnesses who sign a document, but there's very few documents that need a lawyer to commission it or, if, or, or you need a notary. It's usually if you're selling property that you need to get it notarized 
or if you're doing um, an antenuptial agreement before you get married, that also has to be notarized by a special attorney. Um, but otherwise, generally, it's fine. You can just sign it. You don't need to do it in front of a lawyer. But um, the best thing to do is to get some witnesses to sign and make sure that the witnesses put their addresses and contact details on the document as well. Mm. So each, each person has a witness that witnesses them signing it. Yeah. Wow. So what, imp uh, what important uh, deal terms should be agreed upon upfront in a co-production between producers? Because this is where a lot of producers get it all wrong. They, as you said, have an agreement. And then later on, when the film is making money, they're like, no, 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 wait. <laughs> I gave 50% of the work. I did this. I was on set. I was in, and there's all these disagreements that happen. No, absolutely. And I've seen it, you know, uh, you know, unfortunately, it does happen. Producers do have falling outs with each other. They have disputes over, you know, where the project should go. Um, so, you know, again, you know, just have the, all the basics down and written down a document and agreed beforehand. Um, you know, so things like the role that each producer is going to play in the production, you know, what what each producer is going to do exactly. Um, you know, where the copyright ownership is going to sit. Um, what you want to agree is, is how the production fee is going to be split between the two of you um, and the share of producers' net profits as well. That also, that, that, that splits um, also needs to be agreed up front. Um, and also the credits, you know, what credits each, each producer is going to be getting. Um, who's in charge of the production bank account? Um, who's in charge of making decisions about cast and crew. Um, and, you know, whether the co-production, whether you intend to, um, you know, do any sequels or prequels or spin-offs with the same producer, whether that's all included in the co-production. Um, and also then the process that you intend on following if there are any disputes. You know, usually you can go to your local producers association. Sometimes they will... Um, sit down and, and, and discuss disputes between producers and help them come to an agreement. So, yeah, so those, I think, are the basic terms you should have between co-producers when you're doing a co-production. Great. So that's now the first step. You've secured um, your agreement with your co the co-producers. Co You've copyrighted your idea hopefully trademarked your idea as well, because <laughs> that's another, we, we realize those are two separate entities. In my country, I realized that uh, I had a dispute with uh, a client because we co-produced together and we copyrighted. I copyrighted it under my name, but he went on the other side and trademarked the same idea. So now we have to both <laughs> find in such a scenario, <laughs> what are some of the, you know, you could say the lock and key documents that you can have that you can secure that this idea, no matter where I take it in the world, we know that it's the producer's idea. So definitely in, in, in the, in, in the co-producers agreement, um, you know, and in, in your chain of title documents, that will make it very clear where the copyright sits. And so only the, the, the person who owns the copyright or the people who own the copyright are allowed to um, register it um, or trademark it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, then, and then if you are registering it, then make sure, you know, that, that in terms of the, the agreement that you've had, that it's, it's registered in, in your joint names mm. as well. Now, there's a question here before we move on. Is it infringement if you take an audio clip from a speech made by a person sitting in public office, i.e. governor or president, or use it in your short film? Um, no. Um, if, it's, if it's been made in public, then it's, it's, it can absolutely be used, and especially if your short film um, is uh, the, the content of the short film um, is is either you are um, reporting news or the the content of the film is specifically about what that person was saying in a, in public office. Mm -hmm. Correct. Now there's another question here. Uh, what clearances do you need to look out for and clear in the film process? 
Okay, so there's there's a lot of things you have to look out for. Um, you know, if, if, for, first of all, music clearances. So whether you've put, especially put the music in your shot while you're filming, or if there's music playing in the background, like you, you're filming in a cafe and there's music playing in the background, that all needs to be cleared with the, the music company. Um, and then you need... Um, uh, you need to clear your location, so you must make sure that you've got your location agreements in place. Um, this also counts for public spaces. Um, you actually also need agreement from your local municipality um, to actually film in public, so, so um, you'll get that location agreement from them. Um, and, and, you know, and when you're filming, if you've got uh, things in your shot like paintings, um, photographs, uh, if you've got logos, company logos in the background, you, 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 you can, in some countries, you can claim that it's incidental to your filming, but the laws are not the same in every country. So you've also got to think about the countries where yeah. your film could potentially be distributed because they will be looked at according to the law in which, in the country in which they're actually being shown. So, um, you know, so it's always safest to get clearances. Otherwise, just make sure when you are filming that you try and keep company logos, especially out of shots if you, if you can. Mm. You know, things like um, car, um, car, you know, if you've got like a, a, a shot of a, of a car coming in and you've got the car logo at the front, then, you know, just try and shift the camera up a bit so you don't have that logo sort of coming right at you. Um, because what you don't want to suggest is that there's been product placement yeah. by that company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to be careful of that. Yeah. Um, and then what else do you need to, to clear? Um, oh, the other thing I also wanted to mention about that was if you're filming in public and you've got shots of people walking sort of in the background, make sure that you just put a sign up where you are filming, mm -hmm. Just saying that um, the people consent to you filming them by them entering the area where you're filming. So you just have to put like a public notice up to let them know that you are filming and that if they are walking in shots, then they give you their consent mm -hmm. to film them by doing so. Mm -hmm. oh, I love what you've also mentioned there about product placement. And that's uh, a, an issue, a big problem that happens every time uh, filmmakers just tend to have products placed within the, the film. And then later on, what are some of the disputes that can arise when it comes to that? Well, the company whose logo that you're using, you know, um, you know, they could object to say you've used it in a in a movie that has um, content in, say for instance, it's, it's very violent. Mm -hmm. The the company whose logo it is could could come and say that um, you know by having their logo in your movie, you've um, you've damaged their reputation. Um, you know, because people are going to think that that they 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 gave you permission to put it in the movie. Um, and it was product placement, you know. So that's that's one of the things, and you might have to then subsequently spend on getting it edited out of the movie before you continue distributing. Um, and you also have to be careful because then people will claim damages from you, um, you know, if they feel that their 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 logo has been used in the movie and it's damaged their reputation for whatever reason. Oh, okay, guys, you heard that. So another question here is, how can a producer protect protect the copyright in their concept or script when sending it to potential financiers, directors, talents, and ETC? Okay, so, um, yeah, I've, I've seen lots of problems with this, you know, and, the, and this is definitely a stage where pe people's ideas get stolen. Mm -hmm. um, it is a difficult one because people always say that, that, you know, they were inspired by the same things, um, you know, and that, that they never stole the idea, that they were just inspired by something else. Um, so it's very hard then to prove that somebody actually stole a copy of your script or, um, you know, a, a sort of a synopsis or anything like that. I highly recommend sending a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement. Just needs to be a short one. Um, you know, just saying that you are the copyright owner and that they aren't allowed to discuss your script 
or your concept with anybody else and that they can't produce anything that's that's the same or similar to what you've sent them. So it just gives you that extra protection. <laughs> and what happens when they break it? Because it happens a lot, especially <laughs> in my country, <laughs> where you will go and pitch your idea and you've done a whole pilot. <laughs> and then the next thing, you leave the door, the guy sends the, the document to the producer next door and let's shoot it cheaper. So now here you are, you still up, up and coming and you're thinking, okay, how do I start now proving that I was just here in the office and I've shown them the idea. Yeah. I mean, it's a difficult one because it is always ultimately going to involve lawyers yeah. um, and potentially courts. And it's a very expensive um, outlay for you to make, you know, before you've even won the case. So, you know, you just need to make sure if, if you have like these confidentiality agreements, um, it's definitely then easier to prove. Um, also, you, you know, if, if you've got proof that your idea predated the idea that they've said that they've come up with, um, you know, then, then you've got proof that, that, that it was your concept or your script or your pilot episode. Um, and, you know, in ways to, to sort of prove that, um, yeah. Traditionally, you could, um, people always recommended that you sent yourself a, a, a copy of it in the post or by courier and that you don't open it, um, you know, and so, so that will be dated. So that would be a way to prove the sort of the time period that, that your concept was in place. Um, and, you know, you can also email it to yourself or email it to somebody else that you, you really trust because that will also prove the date on which your work was um, in existence. Um, or you can potentially register it, you know, like some writers guilds, if, you, if we're talking about a script, some writers guilds allow you to register it with them. Um, you know, so that will also be proof that's yours. But the thing is that unfortunately then, you know, then you have to start with um, claim letters and letters of demand and, and then, you know, and then the lawyers have to get involved. So um, it's, not, it's not easy. I know it's not easy and it's a long time exactly <laughs> the whole thing back so there's a how can a producer protect the copyright of vast uh, what important terms should you agree up front in a book or script upon agreement sorry say that again uh, what important terms should you agree up front in a book or script option agreement Oh, okay. So um, you, you definitely want to agree um, the term of the option, like how long you've got the option for, uh, how much the option is going to cost you. You want to definitely agree some extension periods. So if you haven't been able to find funding within that initial option period, then you have the, the ability to extend it for another six months or another year. Um, and then you want to agree, um, you know, what role the writer is going to have in the movie if the movie is funded and you've exercised your option. Um, you want to agree exactly what rights that the writer is selling you um, if you've exercised the option. Um, and whether or not the writer is going to have any other involvement in the movie, like as a director or um, as an executive producer, um, you want to agree sort of what the writing fee is going to be if, if, if the script writer goes on to write um, for, for the film or for the, the television series. Um, and, and, you know, and, the, and then you also want to agree the credits with the writer and whether or not the writer has um, the ability to approve the final shooting script um, or not. Um, and if there's going to be co-writers involved, what the credits are going to be as between the main writer and the co-writers. So I think those are, are like the main terms in an option agreement. We are an open discussion and I'd really like uh, you to, if you have any question, you can be able to shoot it to Michelle. Is there anyone with a question as we are going along? Well, there's a question uh, here. Yes, I have a question. I was writing, but it's like it's uh, a bit long. And uh, the question no, it's is, better. yes, the question is, um, we have a situation now, 
at hand in Nigeria. I'm a Nigerian. My name is Osezwa. I'm a producer. There was a man in employment of a TV network, government television network from the 60s as a producer. With the assistance of, his, of the network, he created a program. It was in paid employment. And he, the program was on for a long time. The man retired at old age, he died. And the station they made fit to start that program all over again, to continue It's a series. They engaged an independent producer and they have started, they were almost rounding off when the estates of the late uh, producer picked it up and said, no, they have the rights, the estates have the rights to that program. Uh, of course, the case is still in court and they caught their, their, their on strike as of today. So we don't know how the case is going to go because it's unprecedented in Nigeria. So I just want to get your own um, perspective as a copyright lawyer. Who do you think originally? Is, it right, is that man the true owner of, of the right because he created a program? But it was an employment of his employee of the network while he created that program. And he was on salary for several years, perhaps at five years until retirement. And now they chose to start to run the, to re-record -re new uh, new episodes of the program. The the estate, the, the family came in and said, no, our father owned the rights to that program. How do you think that case to go ideally? Well, um, I don't know it particularly well enough, but I can certainly tell you from, from experience um, and in terms of South African law and UK law, and, and I mean, generally, if you are in a, a paid employee, you're a permanent employee, so you're not just a freelancer. Mm -hmm. If you're a permanent employee, certainly in terms of South African law and the UK law, um, anything that you create during the course of your employment is owned by the person who employs you. So it's the employer who owns it. But now like different countries have different nuances um, and, and, and different um, sort of definitions in the actual copyright law itself. So for example, in South Africa, if you, if you are a coffee maker, for the company, you're permanently employed and you come up with a fantastic concept for a movie um, or for a television series, then that will belong to the employer. However, in UK law, if, um, if you've created something in the course of your duty, so if it's something, so, so if, if, let's take the same example, the lady who makes coffee, she comes up with a fantastic concept. She writes a, you know, like a little bit down and puts the concept down in writing. Then in, and in terms of UK law, because that's not what her normal duties are, then the employer doesn't automatically own it. So, you know, different countries will have these different, um, very specific details in their copyright legislation. So I'd have to look specifically at yours to see what the, 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 the Copyright Act says um, in terms of employment law. Um, and then there's also um, work for hire. So, um, for instance, in the United States, in terms of employment, you cannot assign copyright in something that doesn't yet exist. So you can't assign copyright in future things that you are, are potentially going to write. So then it has to be done in terms of a work for hire and your, your employment contract has to specifically say that it's a work for hire so that anything you do create will then be, um, be owned by the employer. Thank you. Kajubi, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm Brian Kadu from Uganda. I'm an IP practitioner. I work with Nagoya resident. I have, a, I have two questions, but I'll pose one question. It's all related to production of independent, uh, for example, event organizers vis-a-vis -vis TV broadcasting. An example, I organize an event, people enter, but I allow a particular TV station to broadcast live. 
it could be live, it could be um, a recorded uh, uh, documentary, which is later uh, broadcasted. Now, in as much as I've allowed them to broadcast my event, uh, and this is where I need the commercialization bit, where are the loopholes? In the process of this TV station broadcasting my, my event, which I've allowed them, in the case, to broadcast, they later get partnerships, donors, sponsors, and also other companies advertise with them to associate with the event, the broadcasting. Now, I, I seek guidance. Whereas copyright vests in the TV that is broadcasting, that event, be it live or recorded, would it be a weakness of the owner of the event not have negotiated uh, for royalties or a person can indeed uh, pursue or somehow lodge a claim? Because I mean, you, 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 you're using my part of my content and you're making millions and millions out of it. I, I've seen it quite a lot and uh, this way I, I seek guidance. I will save the other question for, for time and to allow others. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think in terms of that, the broadcaster should definitely have um, a license or an agreement with the event organizer um, and also where the event's taking place. Um, you know, the broadcaster's got to get a license to, to broadcast it. And within that license, yes, you absolutely should agree that if you are getting um, sponsorships um, or advertising around it, um, there should be an upfront agreement about how that revenue is going to be shared with the event organizer. Um, you know, so I, the, I don't think it's necessarily that the copyright sits with the broadcaster. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends what the event was, um, you know, what went into organizing the event. Um, you know, whether it was in a public space or not. So there's lots of, of, of questions that you, you'd have to ask um, to kind of first of all decide where the copyright sits. And then, you know, the, and then there definitely needs to be some sort of an agreement about sponsorships around the program um, and advertising revenue. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Anyone else with another question? Okay, here's one. How to how to best leverage IP to attract investors? Wow. Okay. So that that's that's a short question, but that's a very long answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> film financing is um, like a whole nother section of of intellectual property law. Um, it can get very complicated. Um, you can get very complicated structures. You can get easy structures. Um, so, you know, but I think for the most part, the more complicated structures that you get um, for leveraging RP to get investors um, is more sort of for the bigger studios and the, the bigger, the really big production companies. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, for, for the sort of average indie production company, um, I think the... <laughs> the first and foremost most important leverage that you have is to make sure that your chain of title is in place because no investor is going to want to invest in a film where they potentially going to get sued, um, you know, once the film's released and they're going to lose all their money. So I think chain of title is a very important leverage point. Um, I think the potential for merchandising um, in a film is also a really big leverage for, for an investor because you can make a lot of money out of merchandising um, and trademarking something. Um, and then I think also, you know, maybe having in place a, a really great team, maybe a big name star, um, a really well-known director, um, that's, a, you, know, you know, something else that you can um, have in place to, to sort of leverage your IP for investors. Um, just trying to think about it. So you, you, Pre-sale distribution, distribution licenses is another, another form of leverage. Um, you know, so the, the, the licensee is going to um, either give you money up front or they're going to guarantee a payment. 
And then you can then use that um, payment guarantee um, as collateral or security to get a production loan so that you can cash flow your production. Um, and then there's, there's other financing structures you can, you can do. So you can use your RP as what they call direct collateral. It's called collateralization. So basically you're just using your RP as security to get a loan. Um, so the lender will, will lend you money, but what they'll do is they'll hold your RP as security. So if the loan doesn't get paid back to them, then they will take that, the, the RP and they will own it. Um, and then obviously if, 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 if you do pay them back, then the RP remains yours. Um, there's another one you can do called sell and lease back. So you'll sell your RP to an investor or to, to um, you know, somebody who wants to make the movie with you. Um, and then you actually um, get a license back, um, an exclusive license to use your RP that you've sold on. And then you'll pay, um, you'll pay royalty payments for a certain period of time. Um, and then at the end of that, you'll have the option to purchase your RP back. Um, so that's called a sale and lease back. Um, there's other something else called securitization, um, but that is very complicated. And I think it's really for the, the much bigger production companies. Um, so securitization is where you will transfer all the RP into a company, especially just for that RP. Um, and then you will issue securities or shares in the company, which um, investors can then buy. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's an, another another form of of leveraging it. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably the best I can do in the short time um, to answer that question. So I hope it helps. Yeah, it does. It does a lot. And uh, what happens if the person who infringes my intellectual property law rights is based overseas? Oh, that is that is not an easy situation. I mean, it's hard enough trying to um, sue somebody uh, in your own country. Yes. Um, obviously, overseas, it's very difficult. Um, you know, you, you, you would definitely send the usual letters that you would to somebody who's local. So you would um, send them a letter, tell them that you own the RP and demand that they immediately stop using it or stop distributing it. Um, but, you know, more than that, unless you get an overseas lawyer involved, you know, a lawyer from that actual territory, um, it's very hard to take it further. Um, you know, it also depends sort of how your RP is being used. If it's being shown on a, on a video on demand platform, uh, for example, like YouTube, YouTube has a specific process in place where you can um, notify them that somebody's infringing your copyright and they will have it taken down. Um, but it, it is, it can be very expensive, especially from Africa where the exchange rates are not in our favor. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, no, it is difficult um, and expensive. Oh. Remember in the beginning when we started this conversation, we were talking about if you've ever had any uh, IP issue, write it down, we need to hear it. Uh, and also guys, please, we are open to conversations. Ask your questions, Michelle is here. Uh, can I open it up quickly for a question? Oh, there's a question here on the chat box. Can a Ugandan producer register his works with any other country's copyright custody? And if possible, what are the disadvantages? That's from uh, Lata Kome. Okay, um, it is absolutely possible. For instance, um, in the United States, you can register with the United States Copyright Office. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a simple process. Um, and it can, and it's done online. So yes, you absolutely can. Um, I don't think there's any, any, any. Um, did, uh, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Whether there's uh, and if it's possible, what are the disadvantages? The disadvantages. I don't think there is a disadvantage. I think you should register it, um, especially in the countries where you expect it to be distributed. Um, if you don't expect it to be distributed there, then there's generally no point in going through through the efforts um, of doing it. But you know, it's, it, it's definitely you never know whether your movie is going to take off. Yeah. Um, so I don't think there are any disadvantages. I think if you can register it, it you know, it's much better to protect it as much as possible in as many countries as you can if you expect it to sort of go international. Yeah. 
Aubrey, Aubrey has a question. Yes. Good evening. Good evening, Aubrey. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello, Michelle. Hello. Uh, hello, Chris, and everyone who's tuned in today. Sorry, uh, last night uh, we had power failure, and it was I uh, just left the meeting just like that. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, a uh, uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you. I'm just thinking about this, uh, Michelle, Israeli eye opening, you know, because these are usually the issues with districts. We just focus on the art, you know. <laughs> we just want to be creative and we don't think that on the line. So this is really great. I'm trying to think, you know, based on the, the things you are raising about showcasing the products from different companies or their logos appearing on your film, uh, what would be your advice when one is, is doing like a, an outdoor scene, especially in town where, I mean, the whole street is basically bombarded with those kind of things. Uh, like uh, logos of companies on the buildings and on the shops. And, you know, we, we really want to make films that are realistic because when you go to town, you see these logos, you know, normally, you know. Uh, and also, even as you are in the street, there's different cars with different logos on them. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to be practical about it, especially in the context of us making uh, low budget films and uh, maybe you don't really have the time to to do all of that engagement uh, at the same time from what you're saying we have to do it <laughs> so i'm just trying to, to to strike a balance you know and to really find out the way forward but but otherwise this is really enlightening and uh, it's a very very good warning that i really appreciate yeah no problem. So, so you don't always 100% of the time have to do it. You know, absolutely, if you're filming in town, um, you know, and there's a whole lot of buildings in the background with a whole lot of logos, there's nothing you can do about that. That's, they are just there. Um, but what I would, I would recommend is that when you are shooting a shot like that, um, that you don't focus in on one particular logo. Um, you know, and for instance, you don't have your character standing right next to a Coca-Cola logo, you know, because then there is the, the, you have the risk then that, you know, it looks like Coca-Cola has done a product placement with you. Um, you know, if, if you shooting, for instance, in a bar, you know, if, if you're going to have your character holding a beer bottle, for instance, you know, just have them turn the beer bottle around so that the the, you know, the name of the beer is not facing the camera, you know, so it's little things like that you can do just to lessen your risk. Um, you know, but then the rest of the time, you know, those logos that are in the buildings on adverts in the background, you just have to make sure that you're not focusing in on them, that they're not a big part of your, of your shot, um, so that you can argue they are absolutely incidental, um, you know, and there's nothing you can do about them. So if they're in the background, yeah. then absolutely fine. Mm. But it's it's more if they're more prominent in your in, in the shot that you're filming. That's where you have to be careful. Oh, that's true. Good too. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question here. How can a producer ensure that their local law is applicable in a contract where the other party, e.g., sales agent, is in another country? Okay, so in, in the agency agreement. There will be a little section at the end which says which laws are applicable. Um, and then you just have to be insistent that, um, you, you know, because you are in that in your country, um, that you want it and the film's coming from your country, that you need it to be in terms of, of your local law. Um, it is a difficult one because, you know, I know a lot of the, the distributors, the sales agents, they want the law where they are based because obviously it's easier for them. And what it means is if they do um, do you out of any money, it, it means that you 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 can't go overseas and sue them because the, the cost is prohibitive, you know. You so and they kind of know that. So I would just say just try and argue really hard to to have it according to your laws. 
Wow. Uh, Maureen, Hello. Is... Oh, yes. Hello. Welcome. Good evening. It's evening uh, in Ghana. Good evening. It's evening in Kenya too. <laughs> South Africa is right. one yes. hour behind, right? <laughs> My name is uh, John Abekusego. Welcome, John. Yes. Um. Well, I, I used to be the the board secretary of the Audiovisual Rights Society of Ghana uh, for for a long time. So I've doubled in, uh, in in copyright matters for some time. But um, times are changing. The, the scene is completely changing. Now we're moving to digitization and online streaming and all that. I'd want to find out from um, the the speaker whether she has any knowledge of the application of copyright laws in the new dispensation. I mean, uh, of course, we, we've, we've spoken about the, the traditional system for some time, but how is copyright adopted to the, the new dispensation? Okay, so, right. so um, there's many countries who are signatories to treaties, um, the copyright treaties, um, you know, and in those treaties, the countries have agreed to protect the copyright of other countries in their particular country as if it were as if the copyrights came from their country. So it definitely allows um, a more even protection of copyright. Um, you know, and and just because something's online, um, the more traditional copyright laws still apply. Um, you know, the online distribution of the content doesn't change the the, the basic copyright laws. Um, you know, so um, you know, I just think that it, it, with the treaties, it really offers more protection. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 usual copyright laws still apply to online copyrights. Moravi was asking, can voice actors in an animated film claim royalties for the film? Well, they can only claim royalties if they've agreed up front that they can. Um, it really depends on the agreement that they've had in place when they agreed to do it. Um, it's, you know, generally, it's, it's only like the directors, um, the big name talent that gets... Um, royalties and, and sort of a cut of the back end. Um, but, you know, definitely there's, there's no harm in asking, um, but it really depends on the agreement that you've signed up front. There's another question here. Um, okay. Oh, there are two questions. How can we ensure equal distribution opportunities of African content? That is from uh, Kihiri. Kihiri, yeah. Kihiri pictures. Look, I, I, I personally think that um, you know, video on demand is is a fantastic opportunity to get African content out worldwide. Um, you know, and there's many Africans that live um, overseas, outside of Africa, that are desperate to, to watch their own local home content. Um, so I definitely think video on demand platforms are a very good way to get the local content out worldwide. Okay, and there's one from D Daddies. How does an African filmmaker protect his or her rights in a context of licensing a movie in a foreign territory like the US? What uh, precautions should actors, producers take at a level of production to ensure that their rights are subsequently uh, protected in broadcasting territories? Okay, so again, I'm gonna come back to yeah. the chain of title. You've just got to make sure that if everything's documented, you can prove where the copyright is, um, you know, and then nobody can use the content unless they've licensed the content from you to distribute it um, or broadcast it. And then within those licensing agreements, um, you know, you've just got to watch the terms of those licensing agreements. Um, just make sure that they are limited, that you're getting paid fairly. Um, and definitely, if you if you licensing the video on demand rights, um, make sure that you get a cut 
of the revenue, um, you know, that they're not just paying you a flat fee because, you know, if, if it's a very popular um, content, then you could make a lot more money, you know, with having an upfront, like minimum guarantee, but then you also get a, a cut of whatever revenues they make from video on demand. Yeah. I'm allowing you guys to ask your questions because this is a very diverse topic and uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Sorry, Chris, did you say one could ask a question? Yes, 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 you're open to questions. Oh, can I ask a question to Michelle? Yes, yes, yes you're open. All right. Uh, I don't know, I came in like uh, in the middle of the conversation uh, because I just had some little problems regarding setting up because I like to be on the laptop and not on the phone for a number of reasons. I don't know if uh, you cover the issue of music or, uh, you know, music that is used in films uh, because there's an intellectual property side attached to it. I don't know if, if it's also your line of expertise, Michelle, if I could ask something around that. Yes, no, absolutely. I've only just mentioned that that you need to make sure the music's cleared for the for, yes. for the content. But um, no, absolutely, I do I do know music law as well. So please ask. Yeah, I know that you know it's quite a, a challenge, especially for emerging filmmakers, because it, it is quite expensive to to develop music for your film. And then the other thing also that happens to emerging filmmakers who is, is the issue whereby there's a song that you like. And mm. uh, let's say it's a, it's a popular song that normally played and you feel you like to have it in your film, but you're actually not sure how to go about getting the rights for it. So then the first point then is making contact with the people who own the music. And the second point is you, you're never really sure exactly what to budget for it. You know, and you you never you never really know if they will they are expecting to pray to pay a lot, or at the same time you don't want to be too ridiculous in recommending a price whereby they feel like you don't take them seriously or you you just like taking chances. So uh, I'm not so I, I'm really interested. You know, like what what did you say around that issue, and uh, you know of music. And also, uh, there's a, a couple of things relating to, to music in a film. There's a, some scenes where you record something where music is playing on a radio or is playing on TV. And, uh, and the, what is the difference in applying for rights for that when it's playing on, on a radio or playing on TV as part of your scene? Or uh, can you get away with that? That is, it was actually playing on radio or playing on TV, you know, uh, or you also have to um, get the, the rights of it to to be used in that way. I hope you're getting what I'm asking. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's a couple of um, parts to your question. I think let me answer your the last part. If you've got music playing in the background, like on on whether it's on a TV or a radio, um, in the scene that you you're busy filming, yeah. you do absolutely have to get clearance for that music, um, and it will be the same as if you 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 put the music in, um, especially um, if you've chosen music to go into into your movie. Um, so yeah, so and and music rights are very very well protected by the record companies um i definitely wouldn't mess around with the record companies and take a chance um so so so, so then there's also two different um types of 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 clearances so if you're getting music specially made for your film so you've you've got a composer and you you get in the um you get in all the musicians to actually record the music, especially for your film. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier because then you are in control of, of what rights you get from them. And then you would just get all the rights to the music, um, except for the public performance rights, because if a musician or a singer or composer is registered with the local um, music collection agencies for public performance, 
um, then um, they will be entitled to get payment for that as well. So, but then you pay for everything else. Um, so you can get all the rights then, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, but then you just need to make sure that you get the rights from, you know, the all the, the session musicians, the singer, the composer, um, you know, who, who, whoever's actually playing the music. Um, so that's for specially commissioned music. Um, so then if you're talking about music that is already in existence, that you, you like a song and you want to license it, um, music... Music rights are quite complicated because there's so many different parts to them and there's so many different people who are involved in, in like making one song. Um, so first of all, you'd need to find the record company or the producer um, and you would need to get synchronization rights from them and that's where you're going to pay directly. Um <laughs> And that will vary from record company to record company. Um, and then you also have to remember that you've got the composer as well. So sometimes the record companies have the rights um, to for the, the actual song itself. But quite often they don't have the composer's rights. So you will also have to then pay the composer. But the, the, the record company can tell you if they've also got the composition rights to the song. Um, and then you've got the music publishing rights as well, but usually the record company also owns them. So you've got the rights in the actual recording of the song. You've got it clear with the, the, the record company. You've got the rights with the composer. And, um, and then you have uh, the mechanical rights, um, which is the mechanical rights are for the actual recording of the song that you get from the, product, uh, the, the record company. Um, and then you have to also then find out who the composer was. And you might need to also get permission from the composer. Hmm. So, yeah, so it does get quite complicated, but the record company is generally your first stop and they can right. tell you exactly, you know, what rights they have and if you need to also get permission from someone else. And and the the, the amounts that they charge really vary. Uh, you know, if, if it's a small indie production, then yeah. they, they're not going to charge the same as what they would charge, um, you know, MGM or, you know, one of the big studios. Yeah. Do you have any examples, Michelle? Just, just without mentioning names, you know, of what those songs are, like just in terms of the prices, especially for indie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it really, really varies. Um, yeah. You know, it's it depends sort of how much of the song you want to use, um, it depends what country you're from. It depends what you know how many countries you think that the film might be shown in. So the record company is going to look at all of those things, and it it really really does vary. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, may I come in again? Yes, yes, John. This is John from Accra. Yes, Accra, welcome. Yes, from yes. Accra. Um, Michelle, um, what would be your opinion on this matter? There's a, a raging storm between the Audiovisual Rights Society and the Music Rights Society of Ghana over um, collection from the television stations. Mm. While the, the Audiovisual Rights Society insists that it has a sole right to collect from television stations for tele works on, on television. Meanwhile, the music rights also insist that they have a right to the music and therefore they also collect from the television stations. Um, we, we, we've been battling over this. Do you have an opinion on that? Well, I do because we, we've had the same problem here in South Africa. Um, the SABC has been paying public performance royalties to one collection agency, um, but most of the, the musicians that are involved are actually registered with a different collection agency. And so the SABC are saying that they're not paying the other collection agency as well as the one that they have already been paying. So we definitely in South Africa have the same problem with different collection agencies claiming rights. Um, it really depends who the musicians are registered with. But in South Africa, the audiovisual collection agency collects um, performance rights for um, videos, so music videos. But then you also have to pay the other collection agency for the, the music part of it. So just the audio part of the music. 
Um, so I don't know if it's the same problem that you're having there, um, but we also, the different collection agencies are, um, they're not all aligned with who's collecting what, but I personally think that it, it really um, should be, um, it really should be guided by which, which agencies the musicians are registered with. Um, if the musicians are not registered, or the, the, the record companies as well, if they're not registered with, say, for instance, the audiovisual collection agency, but they are with the other one, then it's the other one that should be collecting. So um, that's, yeah, that's my opinion, but we're having the same problem here. But over here, we, the, the Audiovisual Rights Society insisted <laughs> that the musicians should register with the Audiovisual Rights Society as well. For the for the for 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 the music. <laughs> well, I mean, are they saying that they shouldn't register with the other one, or that they should register with both? To register with both. But then, as as the broadcaster, you're paying twice for the same one use of the music, so that doesn't make sense. No, what 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 they said was that since the audiovisual rights society said that since they are responsible for audiovisual material. Then the musicians who have audio um, vi music videos should register with the Audiovisual Rights Society. So they will collect from the television stations for them and pay them as members of the Audiovisual Rights Society. Well, I mean, as, as long as the broadcasters are not paying twice for the same music, then I think it personally should be up to the musicians who they prefer to be registered with. Uh, I have two questions. And the first one is, first, I, I, I wanted to do a movie premiere in the UK. And then I, I, con I made some contact and then I have a friend who is based there as well. And she told me that doing a movie premiere in the UK is going to be very, very expensive. And there are a lot of procedures to take to, to go through before it can be possible. So, and then with everything she said to me, I mean, I, I lost interest in everything. So I just couldn't carry on with the plan anymore. So I just want you, Michelle, to, you know, throw a little light on it, like uh, the processes and um, uh, what it will take for someone to want to do a premiere, a movie premiere in the UK, that's one. And then secondly, one of the issues we usually have here in, in Nigeria is distribution of movies you know, internationally. So I, I don't know if you can um, maybe give us a link or maybe tell us a little about some international distribution platforms that, you know, we can be aware of, you know, moving forward. These are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, look, as far as the movie premiere is concerned, yes, it will, it will cost. And, you know, obviously then you're paying pounds as well. So it's, it's it makes it Costly dirt from from Africa, um, you know. But my suggestion would be is to you know instead of going to one of the big movie theaters to do your premiere, um, to go to one of the smaller independent movie theaters. Um, you know, unfortunately after COVID, there's probably not as many around as there were, and hopefully they will survive, um, so that there will be small independent cinemas where you can have your movie premiere. Um, you know, and I think, you know, a really good way to, to do it is to maybe approach some, um, you know, if, if, if there's sort of a local film festival that um, is doing indie content from, from, from outside of the UK, um, see if you can get your movie in there. Um, yeah, so I think just if you have it at one of the smaller independent theatres, um, and then you've just got to... Um, create maybe lots of social media around the premiere so that um, it's it's well attended. Um, so that would be my, my suggestion for that. Um, so movies on international platforms, we finding here in South Africa um, that Netflix are taking a lot of local content um, and they are fantastic at promoting it on their um, social media platforms. And I think that's a really good way to also get your movie seen internationally, um, you know, because there are people then who, who, who are subscribing to Netflix from overseas um, who will then get to see your content. So Netflix is definitely one um, to watch at the moment, especially for local African content. 
Um, they really are taking a lot of it. So I would definitely approach them if, if, if you can. Um, and then there's so many other sort of distributors around the world. Um, uh, there's a long list of them. I mean, perhaps maybe I can, can send a list of the ones that I know of that you can approach. Um, maybe put it on, on the, oh, our electricity's just come back on. We've had load shedding. Oh. Um, <laughs> All the lights have come back on. So, um, so yeah. So I can I can maybe send a list um, that you can put on on the website or something, a link or something. Yes, we'd really appreciate that, Michelle. Yeah. Um, and I think it'll be available on the platform, on the African Film Producers platform. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll do that. I'll send that across. Um, before I head on to pre infinite. <laughs> Are we good? Before I head on to Prince, uh, Yisha had asked a question. How do I gain rights of a film made if there's no binding contract between me and the company? I have written and directed the film and outsourced my own crew. They also don't have contracts or any documents that says they were working for that company. Wow. Oh. Aisha. <laughs> yeah, Big problem. <laughs> <laughs> that that is who who funded the 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 who funded it was it yourself or the producers? Aisha, are you are you uh, able to make? Yeah. Yes, I kind of funded the film because uh, as a crew we like co contributed, so the company did not contribute anything. And what what is the company doing with it? Uh, so the company is. Okay, so we made this film uh, with this company and now the, the person who is in charge of the company claims to be the executive producer of the film. So he basically does things that he wants without inquiring me, you know. So when I, like, uh, when I want to talk to him about it, he tells me that he wants to take full ownership of the film and stuff. So I'm really, really worried about how to deal with it. Mm. Look, from what, I, from what you've told me, um, the rights definitely don't sit with the company. They will sit with you. Um, and then, of course, all the people who have contributed um, to, to the movie, they'll also own rights. And, you know, unfortunately, if they haven't been... Um, you know, if you don't have any documentation in place, any agreements, um, then each person will own their own copyrights and whatever they've contributed. And so definitely won't automatically um, belong to the company. Um, they will have to get an assignment of rights from you. It sounds like you were the one who was the most responsible for creating um, the, the movie. So I would say most of the rights will sit with you, but you should definitely get, even if you, you get it um, after the fact, um, just get some documents in place um, from all the people who have contributed, just saying that they assign the rights to you. So, you know, so you'll own your rights, but then you need to get them to assign the rights and their contributions. Okay. Thank you very it much. Brian. It definitely doesn't, it, the, the company doesn't automatically own it. My name is Musiwa. Um, I'm, I'm actually calling, I'm from Cameroon. Uh, yeah, so um, the name there is Prince. My name is Prince Musiwa. Yeah, my question quickly is um, for Michelle. You see, I, I have a concern. Can, for example, I'm registered with the Copyright Corporation in Cameroon, the Copyright Society in Cameroon. And um, my works are protected in Cameroon under the copyright law in Cameroon. Can these works be applied? Can the copyright laws here be applied in all over the world? And if not, um, do I need to get registered to a second copyright corporation in whatever country the work is showing? Or, this, uh, or there's an international organization that one can get registered to that international organization and have his or her works declared, and how is the procedure? And then secondly, um, can one actually register, for example, you have, you're in Ghana, can you register in a copyright corporation in the US? And anytime you come to Ghana and do films, 
that the Ghanaian Copyright Society pays your royalties? That's my first question. I'll come back again later. Thank you. Um, okay, so in terms of the copyright treaties, if your work is protected in Cameroon, if Cameroon is a signatory as a country to those copyright treaties, then absolutely um, it, it will be protected in all the other countries where uh, who are signatories to the treaties um, as if they were in Cameroon. So um, it will apply everywhere. Um, I would recommend you'd have to rather only re-register re it in a country that's not a, a, a signatory to the treaty. And most countries are. Um, I don't have the list in front of me, um, but um, I'm happy to, again, send something to the AFP that lists all the countries that are signatories to the, the copyright treaties um, so that you know that your work is automatically protected in those countries. And then, sorry, what was the last part of your question? For example, if 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 can one can I be really for example I'm a filmmaker I'm resident in in Ghana for example, um, mm -hmm. but most of the time maybe you spend time working in the U.S. If by some uh, chance you realize that Ghana probably is not a signatory to the international treaties, or maybe you are even ignorant of the fact if Ghana is a signatory or not, mm -hmm. and you are registered in a copyright corporation in the US or in Europe, can one still benefit his royalties each time his works are being exploited in Ghana? That's what um, I want to know. Um, yeah, so if your work's being exploited outside of the country where you are registered, um, yes, you absolutely should be paid royalties, doesn't matter what the country is, um, because you own the copyright. So, you know, it doesn't then just mean that the country is free to exploit your work without paying you royalties, just because you're not registered or, um, or, or resident there. Okay. And now, if, if take for example, um, I'm registered in the Copyright Corporation in Cameroon, and... Um, well, okay, that came in your first answer because you said the royalties, I have to register in a second country for me to be able to benefit from my royalties. Now, um, the, the last question I want to ask is, um, take for example, um, is there, if, I, if my country is a signatory, is there a procedure for just for information sharing? Is there a way that these royalties are paid? Which means that they do direct payments or they pay through your copyright societies in your country, which is a signatory, or they can pay directly to the artist? No, they have to pay it directly to, to whoever owns the copyright. There's no sort of central base that, that it's not like the music collection agencies in, in each territory. There's no sort of one collective collection agency that collects royalties um, on behalf of all the countries that are signatories. Um, so they, those royalties have to be paid directly to the, 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 you know, the company who owns the rights to the films. And um, if I'm a Cameroonian filmmaker and my works are being exploited in, in a foreign country and Cameroon is a signatory to the treaty, to the International Treaty of Copyright Corporations. Mm -hmm. And I, as a Cameroonian filmmaker, I'm not registered with my copyright corporation in my country. What happens with the royalties from the exploitation of my film in those foreign countries? Well, it should, then come, it, it should come straight to you. As an independent producer. Yes, absolutely. Or if you've got a distributor or a sales agent, um, then it will be paid to them and then they'll pay it direct to you. Okay. I'm saying this because uh, most filmmakers here, um, they have this concern. Some of them probably are not really start with um, the copyright corporation and... Mm. And, and um, they have a concern because when they send films to distributors, these distributors get the royalties and they never send the royalties to the artists because for some reason they explain to the artists that they are not really starting any copyright corporation. That's why the royalties have to maybe end with the distributors. Is that right? 
Um, no, it's not. Those distributors, absolutely, in terms of the agreement that they have and the distribution license they've got, they have to pay that money over. Um, you know, obviously, the distributors will keep their commission and they normally keep distribution expenses. Um, and so you have to be careful when you are entering into these distribution licenses, um, you know, that you limit the distribution expenses that they are allowed to deduct because quite often the distributors um, will deduct ridiculous um, expenses. And then as the filmmaker, you end up not getting anything. Um, but certainly, you know, once they've deducted their commission and their, their distribution expenses, then whatever's left over, they absolutely should be paying over to you. Otherwise, they're in breach of their license. Okay, Michelle, one last question before I go. I'm sorry for bogging you with so many questions. I know that there are many filmmakers out there who are watching and they, they probably have concerns. Uh, I think uh, my last question is that there are filmmakers, there are some filmmakers who are uprising filmmakers. They are still not quite vested with the uh, copyright laws. And uh, I have a feeling that some of them even get registered to these international organizations or international platforms, copyright platforms, and they really never get their royalties. Um, for some reason, can you, uh, is there any platform or is there any um, link or is there any directive on how an artist, an uprising film producer who is enthusiastic about his career and is registered in an international copyright corporation or maybe in a local copyright corporation that is a signatory to an international copyright corporation, how this filmmaker can assess his, um, his exploitatory rights online? Is there any possibility or links? Um, that I'm going to have to look into. Um, I do know that you you would, if if you if you felt that your work was getting used illegally or without your permission in a particular territory that was a signatory, then you would go to their local um, copyrights commissioner um, and you would report them. Um, but, you know, but then again, you've, you know, usually then you have to proceed through the courts or through lawyers, which, you know, the, and then you have to bear those costs yourself. So it, it can be quite prohibitive. So even if you are, um, you know, it, it, it is being protected in terms of the treaty, you still um, personally have to go to that country to enforce your rights. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm off here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Nice, Fritz. Great. Um, <clears throat> we're about to wind up. If you have a burning question, please shoot. Uh, hmm, okay. There's a question here, and the really will answer that if we have a WhatsApp group to help. Yes, we do. I think you can be able to, the uh, really will answer that. Um, are there any more questions for Michelle? Michelle, thank you so much. You know, you are just full of information and I, I'm, we are taking up a bit more of your time. <laughs> you're you're still, still strong. <laughs> um, <laughs> filmmakers, this is your opportunity. If you have any burning questions when it comes to IP, Michelle is right here. Uh, we have a few more minutes to go and you can be able to ask her your question. Um, mine is not a question. It's a, it's a comment. Yes, John. Yes, um, this has been a very, um, it's a very important and interesting discussion. Can I ask members here to begin to um, put some kind of uh, pressure on their local or their national um, copyright societies to link up with the others in the other countries so that we get um, an African uh, rights society going? Ghana and Nigeria... And Kenya attempted to do it some time ago, but it fizzled off. Mm. Um, can we start it again? I mean, get our society idea, to, to link up with each other. That's a great idea, John. Very great idea. I think I think we can lead the way. African film producers can, you know, they can do something about it. So we kind of go um, like Forrester. We are cool with Kenya Film Commission. Then the other ones, we just come together. Then we could, you know build something out of it. Like you said, even if it's three countries, then we keep adding numbers. We, we'll get there, definitely. Yeah. Right. Because the question also here is what action or action should 
should we take in terms of privacy in uh, other countries? So I think that can be able to help. Michelle, what do you think? Um, but yeah, privacy laws Sorry. really need to piracy. Be. Sorry, Michelle, piracy. Oh, piracy, yeah. not privacy, yeah. piracy. Oh, goodness, okay. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank no, you. okay, so piracy laws are standard. Um, you know, pi piracy is piracy. Privacy. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, you know, and, and so you even had an answer for that. <laughs> so, um, so piracy, um, you know, each country should have a piracy federation. South Africa used to have one. Um, they were very active and they really uh, tried to enforce the privacy, uh, piracy um, uh, and it's a, uh, it's, a it's a criminal offence. So they were really good at enforcing that, um, you know, and if people notified them of somebody who was offending, then they would look into it. Unfortunately, the whole, the whole federation has fallen apart. So we actually in South Africa don't have a piracy federation anymore. Um, I'm hoping that they are setting up a new one because it's very important. Um, I used to live, I lived in China for two years and I can tell you that in China, in Beijing, where I was, there were shops that were just wall to wall, floor to ceiling, full of pirated movies. Um, and they just got away with it. Um, you know, so you... You, you actually couldn't buy real real films at the DVD shop. Um, they were all pirated. So it's a really big problem, and I think it's a worldwide problem. And it's even worse now with online. Um, so, yeah, so I just think each country needs to have a very strong piracy federation that looks after the, the country's copyrights. Mm. You're getting a thank you very much from James Kinyanjui. And he says that this was very, very informative. Michelle, you're amazing. Uh, we are also having someone asking for your email. If you do not mind sharing your email, just in case they have other communications, they can be able to do that. <laughs> Olio Atoyan is saying piracy is her biggest current headache right now. <laughs> No, it's a big problem. Yeah. And, and because it's a criminal offence, you've, you've got to get local law enforcement involved. And, um, I mean, certainly in South Africa, local law enforcement is busy with so many other more serious, well, I wouldn't say it's more serious, but, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of crime, other crimes that they are looking into as a priority. Um, and piracy is not the top of their priority list. So it is a problem. Yeah, I think it's also a problem here in Cameroon. It's uh, it's it's quite an international worry. Um, usually, here every region sets up a piracy commission headed by the governor and the security officers and the delegations of arts and culture and from and music uh, and uh, communication. Um, they run in like that. But the, the 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 funniest thing is that at some point you get to realize that the the, the filmmakers and the musicians themselves, they go and give their films to be pirated, not knowing that they actually give the films or the music. So you go to a shop and you realize that the CDs that are there are not licensed and uh, they are not even, um, they have no visa, they have no visa. So at the end of the day, that's a pirated work. So sometimes too, it's about defining what a pirated work of art is. I think it's also a concern. So I just said, let me throw that in as well. Um, actually, I, I am also a board member of the uh, Copyright Corporation of uh, Filmmakers and Photographers in my country here. I'm a board member of the Copyright Corporation. So I'm a little versed with copyright issues here and uh, the law on copyright in Cameroon. Um, that's why um, I was so particular about the questions I raised because um, as the president also of the Producers Guild of the Film Industry in Cameroon, I think I have this double capacity, this dual capacity, and it's important that we relay this information to the stakeholders or the filmmakers back in my country here, and also those who are out there who would want to learn from all of this. I think it's, it's been a very enriching exchange, Michelle. It's so wonderful, and I think this has helped uh, most of us a lot to be able to see how we can expand and integrate our works internationally. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for the platform as well. No, you're welcome. Um, this is for you, producers, filmmakers. 
if you have any other burning questions, please shoot. I'm a freelancer filmmaker, just started and I heard about people registering themselves with the film body in my country. Looking at it for me, it's kind of expensive and I'm yet to make my first coin. And at the same time, I'm afraid that I might make a good that I might make good content and it's ending up being used somewhere else. What's your advice? <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> and the consequences later. <laughs> Michelle, you can go. That's just my opinion. <laughs> No, it's definitely, I mean, I think there's there's very few in, independent producers um, or filmmakers that that make a lot of money. Um, you know, I think most most of it, you just sort of try and cover your costs and um, make a beautiful movie um, that you can get out there. And then, you know, just like, you know, just make sure that you have all the legal documentation in place and, you know, the license agreements, when you're licensing it, that you really read them carefully and make sure that you understand, you know, what license agreements you're signing um, so that you can protect yourself and that you're not taken for a ride. Hmm. Fantastic. Aubrey, you have a question? Uh, I was saying that, uh, if Michelle does not mind sharing her email address right now, I've got a pen and paper here because <laughs> uh, I'd like to communicate with her about, about a few things, you know, beyond this. Yes. That's no problem. I don't mind. And I'm also happy to... Um, I see also Prince has got his pen ready as well, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone is like... Right <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, I'll be sit down. I'll be sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Okay, um, shall, I, shall, I just, shall I just say it or is there a place, shall I write it down in the chat? I don't know. Oh, let, me, let me see if I can get it for them. Yeah, okay, that's great. Well, that's all I wanted. I just wanted Michelle's email right now. Thank you. You get it, don't worry. Okay, well, I'm, <laughs> sure. I'm very happy for the, you, the AFP. You, we both wanted it. Eh? Hello, okay. I have a question, please. I have a question. Yes, shoot, Prince. Okay. Um, first of all, Michelle, um, we're talking about the, pi the piracy thing. I mean, it's really a problem because there was a time I made a film, you know, here in Nigeria. And then I had I have a friend in, in Ghana who called me, and then the film was just on YouTube. You know, I just I just uh, uh, uploaded the film to YouTube. It's not even up, it's not even been up to a week. And then someone called me in Ghana and said the film is showing on a television station in Ghana. I'm like, how did he get there? Who took the film there? You know, so it was really a problem. And then she was advising me on a lot of things to try and get whoever did that or go to the station, the TV station to make an inquiry and all of that. And I was like, if I do this, it's going to take a whole lot of time and then money as well. So, like uh, somebody somebody said, I don't know if there's a way they can they can put an end to this and then maybe a film made in this part of the, the the country, you know, can be can be protected. Like the rights can be protected so that such a thing will not happen. Because sometimes a lot of people take advantage of these things. You know, like there are people who don't make, who don't create content at all, but they are just out there looking for any opportunity at all to make, to grab your content and then take it somewhere to make money, you know, mm -hmm. from it, you know, without your consent, sort of. So, so I don't know if there's a way these things can be, can be curtailed or something. I think that you, you absolutely should contact the television station that was broadcasting it without, without a license, without your permission. Um, you know, send them a letter, send them an email, phone them up. I know it takes time, but, you know, to protect your copyright, you've got to, you've got to take the time to do that. Um, but this is also where I think, you know, if we, if we have a sort of local um, country copyright commissions um, or copyright um, corporations that can assist filmmakers um, you know, to protect their copyrights where they're being infringed in other countries, um, because it, it is, it does, it, it's a cost, a cost thing as well. I mean, it's very expensive to try and enforce your copyrights in another country. 
So, you know, if we can have stronger copyright corporations um, that are representing filmmakers and assisting them with copyright infringements overseas, uh, you know, I think that would be really helpful to, to independent filmmakers. Well, uh, me, um, you. hello. In, in Ghana, you can contact the copyright administrator. Am I on air? Yes, you're on air. Yes. In Ghana, you can, you can contact the, you can make a complaint to the copyright administrator and also the Audiovisual Rights Society of Ghana. Mm. Okay. Okay, can you give us a contact to that effect, please? Yes, you can type it down on the chat box. The chat box is on fire. Everyone wants to join the, the group. There is a link to the African Film Festival WhatsApp group that's on there. Uh, and then there's also a link to um, the Zoom meeting that will be happening tomorrow, same time. Uh, 8 p.m. Kenyan time, but uh, you might just have to, once you click on the link, it will also show you your time in your country. And uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about film marketing and distribution. So before we move on there, I'd really like to invite uh, Kelechi, who is the founder of the African Film uh, Festival, to be able to, to be able to come and just give us a word uh, before we wrap it up. If there are any more questions, please uh, just add them into the chat group. We are going to have a five minutes before we wind it up. Kelechi, are you there? Yes, yes I am. Uh -huh. um, and thank you very much for another great job. Very well done. Uh, Michelle, you are awesome. Thank you for the informative um, uh, gift that you've given us today. Really, that's what it is. It's a lot of gift that you've given us. It's it's um, it's rare to have this type of information at no cost. So we owe you dearly. My pleasure. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I hope everybody got their uh, questions. Uh, answered. Uh, we've dropped the WhatsApp group for the African Film Festival. Uh, I think uh, there's there's another one for Africa Film Producers uh, uh, Forum. Uh, but uh, Isaac is on both uh, forums, uh, so he's he's on the African Film Festival. He's one of the admins there. So whatever questions you may have regarding the topic today, you can ask in the forum and we will uh, be sure to uh, get it to you. And, and you know, this is uh, what the festival is all about, is providing platforms like this for us to grow together. So don't just come and take, 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 take. Uh, try to see what you can also contribute to the growth of the African Film Festival. We are all in this together. Uh, let's build, uh, because what we experience is, um, you know, we have a lot of takers and there's no contribution. So uh, we, we need help in growing the, uh, the, the platform and growing the festival, just as Michelle uh, has done, sharing this great information with us. Any one of you can uh, volunteer to do so the next time, uh, and we can. We, we wouldn't have to wait for uh, another year, festival year, to have this type of information going. It, it can be a monthly exercise. It can be a quarterly exercise. But we need you involved, not just to come and take. Uh, please uh, participate and let's share. That's the only way we can grow the African film industry. Uh, thank you again, Christine. You've been brilliant. Uh, don't forget, tomorrow we have another session, and um, I hope you are enjoying the uh, festivals uh, so far. Uh, if you haven't watched any of the films, they are free on Rootflix. So uh, download the app uh, or go to rootflix.com and click on any of the films. Register. Uh, it's free to register. Uh, and then watch uh, some of the films that are coming on there. Um, again, support the films that come through these festivals. The filmmakers have done such 
great work and hard work to place their films for us to have this festival. So if we neglect their films and just come and listen to what Michelle has to say and get out, uh, we are cheating uh, the filmmakers that have made this festival this year possible. So support them and uh, plan to participate next year as well. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we're also encouraging you guys as well, as you said, to download the app Rootflix and you can be able to watch some of the films that are there. Now, uh, we have a burning question from, uh, before we leave, um, Mike Demo had a question. I wasn't expecting this anyways, <laughs> but uh, thank you guys for this platform. I am really pleased to be here. Okay, so my, my question was, uh, do I have to register with my local film body in order to get royalties for my content? And uh, to get, in order to get royalties for my content, if, uh, if not, what might be the other option? Um, sorry, I'm not understanding what you're asking. So, so you, you registered with your local body to collect royalties for your content. Do I are you have asking to? If I do you have, have to? Yes. No, no, you don't have to. If you, if, if you own the content... Um, then um, who, whoever's using it has to pay yourself if you're not registered with your local um, body. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just to add on, in my country, if you're not registered with the, uh, with the local body, the local film body, the problem is that uh, you're not going to uh, get your film uh, distributed. Mm. And that's where the challenge comes in. I can't take my film anyway unless I get registered with that. Um, look, I know in, usually your film has to be registered, have a copyright registration certificate. Um, but that's different. Um, like in South Africa, it's you, you register, well, you don't register, you just, you, you just get a copyright certificate. Mm -hmm from the, um, the CRPC, which is the intellectual property body here in South Africa. Um, but they, they deal with all sorts of, of um, they do, do trademarks as well and patents, registrations. So they deal with all of those registrations. So it's not a film specific body, um, but you do need to get that copyright register, uh, the, the, the film copyright certificate. Um, from them to prove the ownership of the, the, the final film. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we have uh, one from Prince saying a commercial model is engaged to film for an advert. She signs a contract which is binding that the advert will be aired for three months. But after the said period, uh, you see billboards erected which were not part of the contract. What do you do from Rosa Mensah? Um, okay, so then you need to contact um, the people that you did the advert for or who filmed the, the advert, um, the, the people that you signed the contract with. You need to go back to them. You need to um, find out why they did that. And you, you should be paid for the additional amount of time that they've used it over and above the three months. Mm. Uh, it sounds very easy, but... Uh... <laughs> 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 it does, but uh, it's, oh, yeah, never... <laughs> it's a different story altogether. <laughs> Definitely. In, in terms of the reality, because, you know, I know that South African law is very structured. And unfortunately, um, you know, moving a little bit up in Africa, you know, we, uh, there are certain things that happened in when now you go to court and sometimes people bribe, sometimes, you know, there are all those things that happen. It depends. If you have more money, then you're able to, you know, get your judgment to your side. So I'm sure this is, these are one of the, the situations where they might not have the money to get a lawyer to go to court. You know, what would you advise? Because in as much as it's a, it's a tough situation on this other end, Michelle. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, 
and most of the time they get away with it because they know that you can't afford to to take them to court mm. um and there really is not much more you can do about it mm. you know aside from social media or just warning other people not to do business with them um you know but then you also have to be careful that you know you're not um going into the territory of defamation um that you know you don't want to be sued for defamation okay. um but yeah i would just then be very wary don't do business with them again and warn other people that you know not to do business with them yeah it's uh, it's a very difficult one yeah, I guess, but you've also said that there, social media can be another avenue where you can be heard, at least. Yes. You know? But you just have to be careful what you post, um, you know, that you, you then don't get sued by them for defamation. So, <laughs> yeah. So I think this is that uh, we're going to the end, guys. Um, uh, Tola, Tolo, Toloana, Michelle, what advice do you have for filmmakers whose countries do not issue out copyright certificates or any means of copyright documents that shows whatever material you produce belongs to you? For the, for example, Lesotho. Um, okay, so so then you have your own documentation, which shows again the chain of title. So you you have your own documentation in place. Um, where you get the assignments from whoever's contributed and that you can show that that direct chain of copyright um, and, and, and the eventual sort of the final owner of that copyright. So, you, you, you know, if, you, if, you, if, they do, if your country doesn't issue a formal um, certificate for the final film, then um, you've got your own documentation in place to show chain of title and you've just got to make sure it's in place and that you've, and that you keep it and you have it on record. Uh, Elolo is asking, can the manager of the actor sue the companies bridging the contract between them and Rosa Messiah? And uh, uh, I'm Elolo from uh, Ghana, the talent manager. Um, a deep, no, well, if the if the if the manager hasn't been cited on the agreement as representing the artist, then um, the manager can't do it in the manager's own name. You've got to do it in the artist's name if you're not on the original agreement. Great. Uh, I think now we we can start uh, sending Michelle off to. <laughs> <laughs> with the power that has come now finally <laughs> you can charge all your gadgets <laughs> can and make a cup of tea <laughs> exactly we can't believe it south africa is becoming a third world country <laughs> <laughs> no it's quite simple you have power issues in kenya so to hear you have power issues there it's, it's quite sad <laughs> So uh, I'd really like to thank you once again, Michelle, uh, for availing yourself. And we've learned so much. And remember, all of you who are willing to watch this episode, you can be able to go on our YouTube channel, uh, African Film Producers. We have the link right there. It's very informative. If you didn't get some questions, you can be able to get them from there. And also, we'd like to remind you that you can watch uh, the films that are great, they are prim uh, the films and what is happening at the African uh, Film Festival, TUF. And you can be able to download Rootflix on your gadgets. It's easy so that you can be able to catch up on Sunday. It's going mm -hmm. to be a award ceremony. And we'd really, really like to thank Rwanda Air uh, for powering this session where you fly the dream of Africa. Remember guys, if you're looking for reasonable, affordable flights, uh, you can check out Rwanda Air. Thank you once again. And uh, I'd like to close this session by reminding you once again that this is also powered by African Film Festival Turf. And you can always go and watch what is happening on that end. We've sent the link here on the chat box. Thank you once again, Michelle, and uh, good night. Lovely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you.